Hello, testing. Can everybody hear me? Okay, um, thank you Charbel for that um, very quick introduction to AI safety. That was an overview of the entire thing. Now I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail uh, to two specific things that he talked about. Uh, first thing is AI capabilities and then AI risks. Um, so minutes are precious, so let's dive right in. First thing is AI capability, uh, no that's backwards. There, um, AI capabilities. So you probably heard this word capabilities a lot, but a lot of people talk about artificial general intelligence. What is the difference? Why are we using the word capabilities instead of intelligence? What exactly are we talking about, right? So that's what I'm quickly going to be taking you through. So I'm going to be taking you through what is the definition of AGI or artificial intelligence that we're going to be working with when it pertains to risks and safety. Then why do we expect these capabilities uh, to keep increasing? What are the historical trends that we've seen in the past? and um, just a little bit more of a deep dive into observing how those trends might continue into the future so that we can keep predicting performance. And based on this performance, um, a little bit more explanation, if there's a little bit of time left, of the current state-of-the-art capabilities around the core of both foundation models and the scaffolding that surrounds the foundation models. And then we're gonna get into risks. Okay, so first section, dividing AGI. What do we even mean? Um, when we're talking about intelligence, we need a very specific definition because without it, we can't measure what we are even talking about, right? Without being able to say, hey, this is where we came from, we can't say this is where we're going because there's no uh, standardized unit of measurement. So we're not talking about things like consciousness, subjective experience, sentience, emotions, and all of those things. The core thing that we're talking about is can we measure concretely whether an AI system can do a thing or can it not do a thing? It's a very, very concrete measurement that doesn't get into the abstract notions of intelligence that I talked about in the previous slide. Those are important discussions, but sometimes they tend to be a little bit too abstract, which is why we focus on capabilities specifically um, that are tangible and measurable. This allows us to focus on figuring out what can it do, what can it not do, and measure those um, accurately. But which ones are specifically important? Which ones do we even care about? The ones that we care about are cognitive and metacognitive capabilities instead of things like embodied capabilities that require locomotion in the real world. Uh, we care about things like reasoning, causal reasoning, spatial reasoning. We care about things like problem solving. Can you um, identify problems and solutions on your own? Can you uh, learn and select new learning strategies for different types of tasks? Um, and another thing is tool use. Charbel already talked about this a little bit. We don't really care if the entire system, the general intelligence system, is capable of executing every single task. The important thing is if it can leverage other tools and leverage other narrowly intelligent systems in order to be able to execute its tasks. Uh, this, is, this is similar to how humans do it. We individually can't do everything, but we can invent and use other things in order to be able to achieve a wide variety of things. So things like this is the types of capabilities that we want to concretely be testing for and paying attention to. So, um, and the last thing is we should focus on the path towards intelligence, the path towards increasing capabilities, instead of getting caught in discussions around discrete thresholds of like, hey, have we achieved this like definition of general intelligence or human level intelligence or super intelligence or transformative intelligence? What we can concretely measure is that we are on a continuous curve, right? Slowly, we are seeing, as we saw in artificial narrow intelligence, we are outperforming unskilled humans, then skilled humans at different levels. Um, so we can outperform 50% of skilled humans. This was narrow intelligence initially, um, and we went up the curve until we could outperform every single human in a specific task. Examples were alpha fold, stockfish, alpha zero. Similarly, we're going to see a continuous curve of increasing performance and increasing generality. That is what I want to encourage you to think about, which is levels of artificial general intelligence instead of getting caught into the specifics of, hey, have we reached this threshold or not? We are continuously on the curve of increasing performance and increasing generality. And finally, at some point when you get perfect amounts of generality with perfect amounts of um, performance, you get artificial superintelligence, ASI, um, which is outperforming 100% of us uh, humans at 
all skilled cognitive labor. Right? So, so AGI is the spectrum, artificial superintelligence is the final threshold uh, uh, that we should pay attention to. Okay. Um, it stopped clicking. <laughs> okay, let me just do this. Yeah, but, okay. Um, so, uh, very, very quick recap of those uh, slides. Um, capabilities evaluate what systems can actually do. AGI is best thought of in continuous levels. Measuring capabilities allows us to concretely understand what we're talking about instead of getting lost in the abstract notions of intelligence. And understanding what they're capable of doing allows us to have targeted risk management strategies, both in the technical domain and in the governance domain. So, um, next thing, scaling laws. Why do we expect these capabilities to continue increasing? The first thing that we need to talk about is this thing called the bitter lesson. The bitter lesson is a lesson that people in artificial intelligence learned over the course of roughly about 70 years. The lesson is that general purpose methods that leverage computation tend to always outperform systems that leverage human expertise. So early in the days, we saw things like expert systems or hand design feature engineered solutions um, for vision systems, for uh, speech systems, games, chess, go. Um, and those always ended up losing out in terms of performance to systems that used general uh, purpose search and learning techniques. And this lesson is bitter, or it's bittersweet, according to what side of AI research you fall on, um, because if you can just leverage more and more computation, more parameters, more data, you will outperform human ingenuity. And that is a lesson that a lot of AI safety scientists have had to swallow over the last decades. Um, and it's not just researchers that have learned this lesson. It is also um, all of the big AI safety labs. So you can see a very, very marked increased trend in the types of capability, uh, the types of um, c compute data and uh, parameter count in our models. Uh, we have increased from about 1.5x per year to four times um, the amount of uh, computation per year in the last about 15 years. And I'm going to be deep diving into these graphs later. So what are the uh, specific uh, scaling laws and what are the specific types of computation that we care about? These are the three main ones um, that were first talked about in an open AI paper in 2020. Um, compute, which is the total number of computation, GPUs, TPUs that we use to train our models. The data set size, so how much total data that we give it. And the number of parameters, basically how big is the overall model. And open AI was able to develop ma a mathematical relationship between these variables and predict um, the trade-off between these three, which gives us the amount of performance. So like if I increase the number of computation, then I get this much performance. If I increase the number of data, but decrease the amount of computation, then I get that much performance, and so on and so forth. They developed these mathematical relationships, and they've been built upon in the last couple of years by DeepMind and I think OpenAI again recently. Um, so these are the specific things that we need to care about, which allow us to predict the increasing performance in the years. And if we can predict the increasing performance, once again, we can predict risks, at least to some extent. Um, so this is the summary. Bitter lessons uh, taught us that general purpose computation works better than human engineered domain expertise. Um, all AGI labs have learned this bitter lesson, and they're pumping in a lot of money into computation and data. And scale indicates that we can expe uh, expect AI capabilities to continue increasing in the future. Right, so what are the trends? Um, this is, there was a lot of research done on this in the last couple of years because, as I said, everybody's learned this better lesson. So the first trend is com uh, compute. We can see after the introduction of the transformer, the recent models, the amount of compute used to train these models in terms of GPU has grown, GPUs has been growing by almost four to five times a year. Um, and if you're interested, uh, there are sources for this and more dynamic graphs at the bottom. And I'll also be giving a QR code later so that you can scan and play with these graphs yourself. Um, data, so we can see increasing amounts of data being used to train every single model. Um, at the rate of current consumption of data, we're going to run out of all possible text data that humans have ever generated by 2028. But um, don't worry, models will keep increasing um, in performance because we have image data left, we have video data left, we have transcripts. So even if we run out of text data, performance is not going anywhere. Um, we have 
hardware, uh, so computational performance by GPUs um, in line with Moore's law is getting cheaper, price per performance is getting cheaper, energy efficiency per watt is getting um, more efficient, and so on and so forth. So basically the thing I'm trying to point out is all of these inputs to the AI production function, the AI performance function, are up and to the right. <laughs> Uh, so this is the relative uh, contribution of algorithms. Uh, the relative contribution of algorithmic progress is about 35 and 65% is covered by scale. Uh, similarly, the amount of investment has been growing. Um, according to the trends in investment, the biggest training run is going to cost almost a billion dollars by 2027, um, which makes it very, very important to these companies to be able to predict these trends. So they know exactly how much performance their money is going to be worth in the future. So now that we see that these trends are basically increasing and performance is expected to continue increasing alongside these trends, a very quick uh, dive into the current scaffolding techniques. So what I was talking about currently in terms of trends was the foundation models. This is the core, the LLMs, the multimodal models, the language models, etc. So this core will continue increasing, but we can also uh, do research in the scaffolding, how to turn these things into autonomous agents, and that will give you a further boost into agent-like performance, into performance that um, indicates that the levels of AGI are going to continue moving forward. So very, very quickly, current capabilities. So these are some techniques in how to generate better sub-goals. Um, so we used to have things like chain of thought. Some things like this are already being used to um, train 401, GPT-401. So chain of thought was we can, uh, instead of asking the model to output an answer directly, hey, reason through your process. What would you do, right? Output the sequence of steps that you would follow, and that increases performance. But that was almost a couple of years ago at this point, which is ancient time in AI land. Now we're doing things like tree of thoughts that generate an entire tree of chains of thoughts, or graph of thoughts that um, let go of specific tree uh, branches of the tree and uh, create entire graphs that are interconnected between different chains, modeling a human-like sub-goal and reasoning process. Um, Another thing is we see increases in reflection and refinement. One specific technique is reflection by Shin et al. So we can um, ask the model to critique its own output. And when it critiques its own output, adjust its future outputs based on a critique of its own output. And we can do this in things like reasoning, decision making, programming. It can generate its own unit tests, run the tests, see if it fails, and then uh, modify its code accordingly, um, all in sort of an autonomous loop. Um, memory is another thing that LLMs are often criticized about. So we've seen increases in, um, uh, increases in the ability to leverage context and in, by just writing to external stores, so vector databases, and then you inject things dynamically from the vector database into your LLM. But we also have things like memory GPT. So instead of just reading from vector databases, you can allow the LLM to write to vector databases whatever it considers important to store into long-term memory and then dynamically read from it and inject it back into its own context. So you're getting a loop of not just sub-goal generation, you're getting a loop almost like an operating system memory hierarchy of memory reading and writing that allows even further capabilities. Um, another thing is tool use. Charbel already talked about this a little bit. So this is a hugging face model that uh, allows GPT to leverage the capabilities of every single other uh, AI model within hugging face. So it can query those models and then it can take the output of whatever those models generated and combine those outputs into a much more consolidated answer. So yet more examples here, the tool augmented uh, language models, tool former, hugging GPT. Um, and there's also some neuro symbolic architectures if you're interested in those, the MKRLP a paper from recently. Um, and finally, planning an agency. Um, um, Charbel talked about the Minecraft loop. So if you combine all of these techniques into an autonomous loop, memory, uh, sub-goal planning, reasoning, you get long-term abilities such as being able to plan through an entire uh, sequence of steps that allow you to go from building wood pickaxes to diamond pickaxes in Minecraft if you're familiar with the game and explore like large swaths of land so you can have a skill and template libraries of like hey I learned how to do this I can just save it as a skill and like access it back again later. Basically the conclusion of this particular presentation is that AGI comes in a scale uh, we can measure uh, this continuous scale. Scaling trends are continuing 
uh, research trends are showing that scaffolding techniques around the core models are also increasing. And finally, if we assume this continuing trajectory based on these trends, what are the risks that we can predict in the coming future? And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next presentation. So any questions so far? Um, so sources are on this QR code to the left. If you just scan it, uh, you'll get a Zotero page that shows all the papers that I was talking about. Textbooks to the right if you want to read more. I'll step aside for a second. Everybody can scan. Um, so if there's no questions, then I'll move on directly. No? OK, cool. Um, I hope that woke everybody up, because like now we're moving on to the exciting topic of AI risks. 